for those at home. It is humbling. Uh, since I've been telling your people for decades, don't sit with your knees up, to have to do it now. At least until I get some more flexibility, we'll see. Maybe, maybe not. So welcome everybody to this session, those in the hall and those at home. We all marvel that you're able to do session at home. It's really wonderful. And it's been so supportive of us to know that you're there, despite family obligations and work and so on, practicing so earnestly. So thank you. This is Rohatsu Session 2022. And the theme of our talks is everyone has awakened nature, or everyone is awakened nature. This is from the Zen teaching of Huang Po, Chinese uh, Zen master who lived um, in the 600s, 700s. Our original Buddha nature is in highest truth, devoid of any atom of objectivity. It is fluid, omnipresent, silent, pure. It is glorious and mysterious, peaceful joy, and that is all. Enter deeply into it by awakening to it yourself. Your total life is it in all its fullness, utterly complete. There is nothing beside it. Even if you go through all the stages of a bodhisattva's progress toward Buddhahood one by one, when at last, in a single flash, you attain to full realization, you will only be realizing the Buddha nature which has been with you all the time. And by all the foregoing stages, you will have added to it nothing at all. You will come to look upon those eons, eons of work and achievement as no better than unreal actions performed in a dream. And yet, the years of practice have many effects. That is why the Tathagata said, I truly attained nothing from complete, unexcelled enlightenment. Had there been anything attained, Divamkara Buddha would not have made the prophecy concerning me, concerning the arising of a future Buddha. This Dharma is absolutely without distinctions, neither high nor low. We call it Bodhi. It is the pure foundation of awareness. The pure foundation of awareness. So when we reach a state of awareness, we have to go further. Which is the source of everything in which, whether appearing as sentient beings or as Buddhas, as the rivers and mountains of the world, which have forms, as that which is formless, or as penetrating the whole universe, is absolutely without distinctions, there being no such entities as selfness and otherness. Above, below, and around you, all is spontaneously existing, for there is nowhere which is outside the Buddha mind. Each person without exception no matter what your inner critic thinks, has been endowed since before their birth, before your great, 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 great grandparents were born with Buddha nature, with true nature. We have these inadequate names for it, the nameless. Each person, each bit of creation has been born out of it, born out of the endless creative outpouring of this eternal, immeasurable, ungraspable source of all existence. Each emergence is due to the working of billions of years of cause and effect. Your birth dependent on everything that came before it. The unimaginable workings of cause and effect millions, 
billions of causes and effects, and effects which then became the cause for the next effects, and so on. Brought you into life and brought you right now into this meditation hall. Therefore, you should not lament anything that happened in your lifetime, this particular lifetime. It was all part of bringing you to join this Sangha family, to come to this place, where conditions are made optimal for all of us to awaken. Sometimes bit by bit, and sometimes in larger slips. More suddenly in larger, or apparently suddenly, in larger slips. Here in this place made optimal, we can drop away unnecessary thinking. What shall I eat tonight? Do I need to go shopping at the grocery store on the way home? Oh, I'm, I wonder if I have enough gas to get to the grocery store. And what time does it close? What time shall I get up? And the really big question that is solved by coming to Sashin, do I have time to meditate today? <laughs> Conditions are here made optimal for us to awaken fully to who we really are and to investigate what the heck is going on. We come to practice with questions about what the heck is going on? Why is there so much suffering? This is a fundamental question that all religions have to ask and answer and answer in their own way. The question could be, why does a loving, all-seeing, and all-powerful God allow so much suffering? Then we're given answers like original sin, or being tested by God, or being purified in order to enter heaven when we die, or some scheme so unimaginably unimaginable uh, on God's part that we just have to agree to go along with it and trust. In another religion, the question could be, what did I do that apparently angered one of the pantheons of many gods so that I'm now being punished? Which god was it? And how can I appease him or her? Do I offer a goat or my firstborn child, or gold, or one of my fingers? This was the question that compelled the Buddha to leave his palace, the original Buddhist koan. What is the cause of human suffering? And is there a medicine? Is there a treatment that will lessen it, modify it, or even end it? And each person here has that same compelling koan. What is causing my own suffering? Can I look within and discover the source of my suffering? Once discovered, can I modify it? And if we have taken up the bodhisattva path, we're asking a two-part question. How can I lessen or end my own suffering so that I can help others to suffer less? Using the particular knowledge and skills that I have been born with or learned, how can I help others to suffer less? The arena that we're called to work in doesn't matter. There are infinite ways to help and infinite people, beings, planets, needing help. It could be cleaning the apartment for a person who is disabled or old and can no longer do it for themselves. Or it could be buying groceries or driving them to an appointment with their doctor. It could be serving in a United Nations peacekeeping force. 
or vaccinating children in Colombia or giving money so that a village in Africa can drill a well and for the first time have access to clean drinking water. Or it could be adopting a wild horse or giving extra tomatoes from your garden to the food bank or raising a child who knows they are loved and safe and who is moved to help others. Suffering is endless, and there are countless ways to take up a piece of it to help relieve it. The jigsaw puzzle of bodhisattva locations for work is boundless, and each piece is important and fits into all the other pieces. Original nature can take any form, and many of these forms need help in their lifetime. And in giving that help, we benefit more than the person or animal that seem to need our help. As Hogan mentioned, Huang Po lived in the 800s. What I said first was wrong. His full name was Jiyun Huangpo, Jiyun of Huangpo Mountain. So the abbots are named after the mountain where they teach. So technically, Hogan is Hogan of Jiwashan, or Jizo Mountain. Huangpo in Japanese is Obaku Kiyun. His teacher was Baishang, whom we know in Japanese as Hyakujo Ekai. And we know best as the teacher in the famous koan Hyakujo's Fox, which is essentially the question, is a person of enlightenment free from cause and effect or not? We chant these names, Obaku Kiyun, Hyakujo Ekai. Toward the end of each week, when we chant Shoto Harada Roshi's lineage, the lineage of the Rinzai school, Huang Po had 13 transmitted disciples, including Lin Chi, in Japanese, the famous master Rinzai. And Huang Po was said to be extremely tall by many accounts as tall as seven feet. Here's a story about him. He also trained in the school of hitting and yelling, so you can imagine a seven-foot person yelling at you. So this is a student of Huang Po's. Page B presented Huang Po with a text he had written on his understanding of Chan. So I'm smiling because there are endless books out there that people have written, including me, of our understanding of Chan. Wang Po placed the text down without looking at it, and after a long pause asked, Do you understand? Pei Chui replied, I, I don't understand. Wang Po said, If it can be understood in this manner, then it isn't the true teaching. If it is seen only in paper and ink, then it's not the essence of our order. Remember from the first reading that we're leading each talk off with, Wang Po said, Our original Buddha nature is, in highest truth, devoid of any atom of objectivity. That is, it is not an object to be attained. It shines forth brightly, but we cannot see it because our eyes are turned inward, distracted by the thicket of thoughts and emotions that churn within. And our eyes are turned outward now, distracted by doom scrolling and by the apparent adventure of long video games or long Google searches one thing leading to another, to another, 
We all know this well. We could update what Huang Po said as, if it is seen only in ink and paper or on your computer screen, or something you're repeating from a podcast you liked, it's not the essence of our order. <laughs> Seeing a photo of a strawberry, please bring a strawberry into your imagination. Hearing someone describe a strawberry is actually a mindfulness exercise for children where the child tries to, is, is holding the last tangerine on, imagining it's the last tangerine on earth or the last orange on earth. And now it's disappeared and they have to describe it to someone who has never seen or tasted an orange or a tangerine. So you can imagine somebody trying to describe a strawberry to you if you've never seen one. Even smelling strawberry perfume. The reason this came to mind is when uh, one of our uh, grandchildren was young, there was um, a method for calming a tantruming child down by putting strawberry perfume under their nose. And there are many videos of it working almost instantly. It's very interesting. That you know the olfactory nerves are the go, have the shortest distance to the brain. So uh, smells have a, quite a bit of power. So seeing a photo of a strawberry, hearing someone describe a strawberry, even smelling strawberry perfume, is not the same as holding a strawberry in your hand, taking it in with your eyes, its bright shiny red color and the hundreds of seeds indenting the surface. It is not the same as the changing textures of biting into taut red strawberry skin, followed by soft white interior as you take the first bite. It is not the same as the flavor on your tongue. If we see enlightenment only through reading books and listening to podcasts, it is not the essence of our order. It has to be experienced directly. Experienced directly. Refined and tested in daily life. And expanded and cleaned up by working with a teacher. And by doing sashim. And by doing sashim. If we just sit here and diligently turn our minds away from thinking and toward whatever the method is, in Chan it's called the method, breathing, listening, risking failure by diving into a koan, all of these over and over, we will all see through another delusion and experience another Oh, yes. Oh, why didn't I see that before? That's the excitement about coming to Session. We cannot know what will happen. What of the patched together walking and talking bundle of delusions and strategies that we define and defend as ourself? the walking and talking bundle of delusions and strategies that we define and defend as ourself, what will we be able to see through and watch fall away? Defining and defending, Lama Michael Conklin defined the self as the process of defining and defending personal territory. Yeah. When our mind wanders off, is that activity of defining and defending somehow at work? What are we defending against? Can you catch it in action? In one of our chants it says, when the mysterious pivot finds opportunity to turn. We cannot force the pivot to turn but we can optimize conditions for it to turn through continuous practice. 
how to make our practice continuous. This is where mindfulness is essential. So mindfulness has become a catchphrase now and everything is labeled as mindful to the point where I'm going to be talking to Kaiser healthcare professionals um, early next year and they, we had a meeting, a strategy meeting about it and the person who's head of wellness programs for Kaiser in San Francisco said, we have to start knowing that some people are suspicious of mindfulness. So we have to back up. And probably I shouldn't use the word meditation. Interesting. Hmm? Interesting that something that's so essential to our life is now something that people are averse to. (laughs) And they've only heard about it. They're just averse to the words. So mindfulness is essential. Essentially, we know what mindfulness is. It's putting the full attention of the mind in what's going on right now. So picking one thing to be mindfulness, mindful of, is where it begins. Perhaps mindful of the feet and the earth beneath as we walk from here to a meal. And maybe we're interrupted by washing our hands, but we still stay mindful of the feet and the earth beneath us. Or challenging ourselves to stay mindful of our feet for one complete serpentine go around the mats during kinhin. So if I start down there, I have to say to myself, go. And then I have to keep my attention in my feet and the earth beneath my feet for one entire go until I get back to near my place. Then I relax, do it again, then the challenge again. Or taking up the challenge of keeping our chosen practice going as we hear the stretch bell and we adjust our posture. The temptation is to hear the what we call sometimes the wiggle bell and think, oh, thank goodness, another two minutes and I would have begun whimpering. And that thought gives rise to another. Will this much sitting do damage to my knees? Is it an occupational hazard like traumatic brain injury in football players? And then maybe, we, maybe I should see if there's any research on like Zen masters and their knees. And another thought appears. I wonder, have they carefully hidden from us the fact that many of the old masters were actually hobbling around crippled after years of sitting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So really attending, attending to what is during that intermediate bell, not dropping our practice. Some of you have never participated in our chanting service before, or at least in the new chant we're doing in the evening. And some of us have all the chants memorized so we don't have to be mindful during chanting service. We can dual track. We can think about something else while another part of our brain rolls the chant effortlessly out of our mouths. During 50 years of practice, I have had every reaction to morning service, from being totally enchanted by it, from to thinking it was a kind of ridiculous imitation of ancient Japanese ceremonies, like black and white penguins waddling around, to dual tracking, to being amazed when, apparently randomly, a line from one of the chants suddenly opens up. Oh, that's what it means. In the middle of an ordinary day, because the chants have become implanted in my heart-mind and can emerge appropriate to, oh, oh. To now, when I've learned ways to just be present during service. No aversion, no enchantment, just chanting, just bowing. Here are some ways to enter more actively into morning service. To be able to practice more continuously during this session. And these are just suggestions. You can find your own way. Bowing. Thich Nhat Hanh calls it touching the earth. Thank the earth as you touch it reverently with your forehead for everything in and on you. 
and in this room comes from the treasure house of the earth. So touching the earth practice you could pick up. Atonement, atonement practice. With each bow, say, I'm truly sorry for any harm I have caused to others or to myself, knowingly or unknowingly. Or just the physical act of bowing, bring attention to how the body manifests a bow. How does it start a bow? Does the head go down first? Or do the knees begin to fold first? And then what happens? And then what? And then what? And what happens if when you're down, you stretch your back out on purpose? You push your hiney out and lengthen your spine at the bottom of a bow. How does that feel? And then similarly, watch all the steps as the body gets up from a bow. A really nice practice. So at uh, one point, Harada Roshi said, Chosen does methodical practice. So I'm giving you an idea of my methodical practice. <laughs> so um, this is from uh, Dogen Zenji called A Bow Upon Meeting. So as you know, we have this practice when we pass each other, um, in, especially on the sidewalks as we're walking to and fro when our mind tends to be already in the thing we're going to, that we stop stop and bow. This is from uh, Dogen Zenji in the 1200s. From the Ehe Koroku, so this, the, that's a collection of short things that um, Dogen Zenji said to the assembly, not a whole Dharma talk, kind of like I do in the morning here. Last winter, I especially instructed all you brother monks Whenever fellow monks meet, meet each other in the hall, on the walkway, by the stream, or under the trees, lower your head and bow and gasho to each other in accord with the Dharma. Then start to speak. Before bowing, it is not permissible to speak to each other on great or minor matters. We should always make this a constant rule. This is the ordinary tea and rice custom for Buddha ancestors meeting each other. How could Buddha ancestors not conduct themselves with such decorum? Where Buddha ancestors are, there is, uh, there is offering incense, spreading fragrant flowers, flowers raining, scattering petals, and asking after the harmony of the four elements, meaning each other's health, and inquiring as to whether those seeking instruction are difficult. One of my favorite lines. <laughs> so inquiring of each other whether those seeking instruction are difficult. If this occurs, meaning not difficulty with students, but <laughs> um, if bowing occurs, if gasho occurs, then the jewels of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha will manifest. And then there's a footnote. Gasho is a formal gesture expressing gratitude or respect. Done with palms joined together in front of one's face, fingers straight up and fingertips about at nose level, hands one width, one fist width away from the face. It may be performed while bowing or standing erect. So this is particularly interesting because Onshin, before he left for Sashin uh, at Budai, gave us instructions about proper gasho. And of course, it comes from the Indian custom of namaste, which means I recognize the holy in you, the sacred in you. So that can be an expression of gratitude, not just a body action. And there needs to be the heart and the mind <clears throat> in the gasho. So I used to, when I passed people and did gasho, I, I began the custom of saying, um, I'm glad you're in my life. And then on further reflection, I changed it to, I'm glad you are my life. Because right now, this is your life. You have no other life. 
Everything else is imaginary that you call my life. This is it. This is exactly what makes up your life. These are the elements of your life. These dots of black and brown and purple and blue. These glowing gold globes. This is the only life you have right now. This is it. So if we're grateful for being alive, we're grateful to every element that makes up our life. I'm glad you are my life. So the Heart Sutra, many practices we can do as we chant the Heart Sutra, but fundamentally it speaks about everything being empty. So one thing you can do is open your mind to the spacious emptiness of this room as you chant and let that spacious emptiness fill your mind. Don't try to analyze the words. They will sink down into your subconscious and flare up as conscious experiences in the body-mind, even years from now. Chanting the Daishin Durrani. This is a chant for people who have died. At Sogenji is chanted many times during every morning service and also several times before Teisho because Sogenji is an endowed temple that has been chanting for the deceased members of the Yikeda family who built the temple since the temple was built in 1698. And each person that they are committed to chanting for receives a Daishin Durrani chant of their own. So they do the Daishin Durrani, they do a dedication in Japanese, they do the Daishin Durrani again, they do a dedication, and so on. One way to practice with this chant is to bring to mind someone you care for who has died and to stay as present as you can while you chant with them, holding them in your heart-mind, and then dedicate any merit that might accrue from that activity of chanting to that person in whatever realm or embodiment they are in now. So these are just some hints about maintaining continuous practice. You plunged into this session just two days ago. On the first day, we realize how tired we are, especially coming from outside, how we've brought with us fatigue that we didn't know was accumulating. The second day, we begin to get into low gear, and we become comfortable again with following the breath or whatever our concentration practice is the clutter in our minds begins to dissipate and we start to catch the minds wandering earlier. We become interested in why that's happening, that wandering, that apparent discomfort, with remaining for very long simply being present, simply aligned with the flow of our life. The myriad causes and conditions begin to align with our genuine vow to become awakened to become aware of what our ceaseless selfing activity has been covering up. There are countless teachings, countless realizations awaiting awaiting each person who practices diligently. Please clear and prepare the ground for them to arise. Dogen Zenji says, we will gradually become aware of our Buddha nature without realizing it. Our original Buddha mind is always trying to manifest itself and to help us. That is why you are here. Buddha nature has called you from within you to leave your home, to come here, to recognize its manifestations in all of creation all of creation, including you. Please practice diligently. 
and in a sustained way, returning, again, returning, again, returning, to here, to now. And don't be afraid of what will drop away and be revealed. <laughs>